This is a Library Channel special presentation. Constitution Day 2006. Part 1, The Constitution in Action, Review and Preview of Upcoming Constitutional Supreme Court Cases. Presented by Dr. Catherine O'Grady on the ASU Tempe campus in the Carson Ballroom of the Old Main Building. Our program will begin in just a few moments. Good afternoon. My name is Dan Stanton. I am the Arizona Local Documents Librarian in the Government Documents and Maps Department here at Arizona State University. And I'd like to welcome you to a more perfect union, the life and times of the U.S. Constitution, brought to you by the ASU Libraries and the Ross Blakely Law Library. Uh, Exactly two years ago today, on September 15, 2004, Senator Robert Byrd of West Virginia submitted a bill to make the date of the signing of the United States Constitution, September 17, 1787, a legal public holiday. The senior senator from West Virginia is currently the longest serving member of Congress and a champion of the U.S. Constitution. In his own words regarding the Constitution, the U.S. Constitution is the longest running written constitution in world history. It defines us as Americans. The three branches of government that the Constitution created are the hallmarks of our national political life. These branches also wield great influence on each of us personally. The limits that the Constitution places on how political power is exercised have ensured our freedom for more than two centuries. Our Constitution embodies the vision of the framers, their dream of freedom, supported by the genius of practical structure, which has come to be known as the checks and balances and separation of powers. But we cannot defend and protect this dream if we are ignorant of the Constitution's history and how it works. Ignorance is ultimately the worst enemy of a people who want to be free. When Senator Byrd proposed his legislation, he included provisions for celebrating uh, the wisdom of provisions within the U.S. Constitution, enhancing the awareness of the themes of the U.S. Constitution, and preserving the place in history of the Constitution in, in our United States history. On December 8, 2004, Public Law 108 447 mandated, amongst other things, that each educational institution that receives federal funds for a fiscal year shall hold an educational program on the United States Constitution on September 17th of such year for the students served by that educational institution. We figured you folks wouldn't be coming out on Sunday, so we're having it today. And there are many ways which an institution, institution such as Arizona State could have commemorated Constitution Day. We have chosen to look to the vast and varied expertise of our faculty to examine issues past and present which highlight the importance of the Constitution. We hope that today's program honors the spirit of Senator Byrd's vision for Constitution Day by giving us a chance to think about the meaning of the cornerstone of our republic. I'd like to thank my two fellow program coordinators, Mark Scott, Assistant Librarian in the Government Documents and Maps Department, and Victoria Trotta, Associate Dean for Information Technology and the Ross Blakely Law Library. I'd also like to thank our presenters, Dr. Catherine O'Grady, Dr. Catherine Kaplan, and, Prof and Dr. Joseph Russomano, and folks from the library's media department, Matt Harp, Fred McElvain, Mimo Banani, Rob Fiddler, for the podcast that we had and the video streaming that should be available from the library's website in the coming week. I'd also like to thank Associate Dean Vicki Coleman, uh, Government Documents and Maps Department Head Brad Vogus, Jenny Duvernay, and Lily Johnson for their assistance in this. And now I'd like to introduce Victoria Trotta, Associate Dean for Information Technology, the Ross 
Blakely Law Library who will introduce our first speaker. Thank you, Dan. Um, I just want to start by saying that the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law is just honored and thrilled to be a part of this inaugural Constitution Day celebration. Um, and it's my distinct pleasure to get to introduce the first speaker this afternoon. Before I do, if I could make a plug for the libraries, both Hayden and the Ross Blakely Law Library. Uh, both of us are federal depository libraries. Um, the Hayden Library is a much bigger one than the Ross Blakely Law Library collection, but still in all, uh, this campus is a wonderful source of information about the government, both about the government and, and the publications of the government. And over here on the right, we've put together a display of some of our favorite books and things about um, the collection. The, for the Ross Blakely Law Library side, I brought over some books about uh, biographies of some of us Supremes, some books about them, uh, and some other books, so if, and books just about the court. So I hope you'll get a chance to take a look at that display uh, while you're with us this afternoon. But I digress. The real reason I'm up here is to introduce our first speaker. It's a distinct pleasure for me to do this. Catherine O'Grady is one of the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law's most distinguished professors. And for the sake of time, I'll only be able to hit on a few of her highlights. We are most proud to note that she is a graduate of our law school. And she distinguished herself both as a scholar, as a student, and as a contributor to the programs of the of the school. She graduated magna cum laude, and she was, upon her graduation, she was awarded the, the John S. Armstrong Award, which is, uh, is the highest honor that a college faculty can bestow upon a graduating student. Since her graduation, Professor O'Grady has had a varied and successful legal career. She, after law school, she clerked for Judge William Canby of the Ninth Circuit, and then she became, she went into practice with the local law firm of Meyer Hendricks, um, Victor Osborne and Maladon before she came to ASU. She got to the law school in 91. She teaches classes in civil procedure. She teaches the civil justice clinic, the practice of law in a digital era, which is her newest class, as well as a seminar on the United States Supreme Court. She also serves as executive director of the College of Law clinical programs. And this is an area that's really, she has grown. And there are now seven clinics in the college. The funnest thing about her, I think, well, not the funnest, but one really neat thing is she regularly appears on KAET Horizon Show about the work and the cases in, of the Supreme Court. And so we're proud to see her. She's our media star. The title of her lecture today is The Constitution in Action, Review and Preview of Upcoming Constitutional Supreme Court Cases. So please help me welcome Catherine O'Grady. Thank you. Good afternoon. And thank you so much, Tori, for that nice introduction. I really enjoyed sitting there and hearing about myself like that. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure for me to be here this afternoon to celebrate the Constitution and to talk a little bit with you today about the Constitution in action. I come here this afternoon bringing my own well-worn pocket Constitution. You guys all received a, a brand new one at the door, or if you haven't, I think there are some available for you. Um, mine has been thumbed through. I, re I picked it up at a bicentennial celebration of the Constitution. So I don't want to do the math and figure out how old this, this little pocket Constitution is. It's amazing that I still have it. Uh, and I actually kind of cherish it for some reason. I'm not sure why. Um, in the foreword to this edition of the Constitution, Warren Burger, who was the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, from 1969 until 1986, wrote the following words, which I thought kind of framed my remarks for this afternoon. He said, our constitutional system does not always provide tidy results. It depends on a clash of views in debate and on bargain and compromise. He noted the imperfections, but, but also noted that the Constitution has continued longer than any other written form of government and that for over 200 years, its ordered liberty 
has unleashed the energies and talents of people to create a good life. I like that image, the image of a tidy, and in this case tiny, document of ordered liberty unleashing a clash of well-intentioned and sometimes even intellectual chaos. Um, as a whole, we have here a document that creates three separate independent branches of government, as Dan noted, uh, with checks and balances for all. The United States Supreme Court, of course, sometimes referred to as the third branch of government, is instrumental in interpreting the Constitution as it reviews federal and state legislation pursuant to constitutional dictates. For the first time in many, many years, this first Monday in October, we will begin the term with a brand new United States Supreme Court because two new justices joined the court last term, Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Sam Alito. The new Chief Justice got a very early start on the term, last term, but Judge Alito joined the court uh, late and participated in less than half of the total cases decided. So this upcoming term will be the first time that we'll have a chance to look at this entire, entirely new group uh, of nine justices um, who will sit together for the first time for a full term. The numbers from last term, based on Judge Alito's participation in 38 cases of the 82 that they resolved last term, show him to have the highest rates of both agreement and disagreement with his colleagues on the court. He agreed with Justice Roberts in full in 89% of the cases that they both heard together. Beating out for the first time in years the always agreeable, at least to each other, duo of Justices Scalia and Thomas. At the same time, Justice Alito had the highest rate of disagreement with a colleague, and this time it was with Justice Stevens, with whom he disagreed 45% of the time. Now this may be due to the fact that Judge Justice Alito participated only in the latter part of the term, and that is when the court hears and decides the most contentious cases on its docket for that year. But <clears throat> these early indicators suggest that Justice Alito might well be the most conservative jurist that we now have sitting on the United States Supreme Court. It's too soon to draw any conclusions, but we certainly look forward to watching the Supreme Court this year as it uh, proceeds with its term. Turning now to look to the Constitution in action a little bit with the cases uh, before the court, I thought, we'd <clears throat> I thought we'd talk a little bit about three hot button issues that are before the United States Supreme Court and in the news, especially recently, um, and those involve <clears throat> Osama bin Laden's driver, abortion, and racial integration, not all from the same case. Let's talk first about the Hamden case. It is all over the news and has been for several days. This case decided five to three last June on the very last day of the term last year is a key constitutional case. It's not a constitutional case in one sense. It did not involve the court analyzing the constitutionality of federal or state legislation. Rather, it's a constitutional case in a structural sense. It's a case that required the court to define the scope of presidential power in this war on terror, and it required the court to analyze whether, within the context of that power, what is the responsibility of the administration to follow Congress's rules, rules that are set forth in statutes. The case involved a suspected member of Al-Qaeda, um, Osama bin Laden's former driver, Salim Hamdan. Hamdan was seized in Afghanistan and taken eventually to the base at Guantanamo Bay. Two years after his capture, he was held there, uh, detained as an enemy combatant. He was found eligible for trial by military commission. The president has the authority to order military commissions pursuant to a military order that was issued in 2001, shortly after 9-11. This is the order. I, I have it with me here. The Constitution gives Congress the power to declare war and make rules, but the President, as of course we know, is Commander-in-Chief. So here, the President used his authority as Commander-in-Chief, as dictated by the Constitution, and as well as a joint resolution of Congress, 
which I believe occurred the day after 9-11, authorizing the President to use all necessary and appropriate force to issue this executive order creating the military tribunals or military commissions. So that's how we got to this. And um, Hamden was the case that tested it from last term. He eventually filed a petition uh, as he was being uh, charged. He filed a petition challenging the legality of the military commission, which he said violated the Geneva Convention and the Uniform Code of Military Justice. The district court that heard that petition agreed. And it went to the District of Columbia Court of Appeals, where that court, with then Judge Roberts on the majority panel, reversed, finding that the president did have authority, the district circuit court ruled, could, um, could engage in the military tribunals and, and run them the way he wanted to, um, and that that wasn't a problem with either the statutory authority, the joint resolution authority, or the Geneva Convention. So what's the difference, first of all, between these military commissions and the civilian trials or courts martial? The primary there's many, there are many, many differences, um, and there are just a few that seem to be highlighted in this particular controversy that's brewing right now. The primary differences are in military commissions, there's no presumption of innocence, unsworn statements can be admitted instead of testimony, and the standard for admission of evidence is very low. Hearsay evidence is admissible, which wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't be uh, considered reliable in, in, the, in a court of law. Evidence obtained under coercion or duress is admissible. Um, there's no appeal other than a review by the Secretary of Defense and the President. These courts are an arm of the administration and not an independent branch of government. Um, and the, this is really key to what's going on now. The accused can be excluded from the proceedings and denied access to all evidence brought against him. So suspects can be denied um, direct access to classified evidence. There are also provisions for uh, secrecy, secret evidence, and you know, uh, less openness, of course, that kind of thing. So as you likely know now from the news, the administration back in June, uh, when this case came down, was not happy with the result in Hamden. The five justice majority handed Hamden a near complete victory. Justice Stevens wrote the majority opinion, joined by Breyer, Ginsburg, Souter, and Kennedy. Justice Scalia, Thomas, and Alito dissented. And of course, Justice Roberts uh, did not participate in the case because he had been on the, the lower court panel that had ruled in favor of the administration. So the majority decided a number of things in that case. First, that in instituting military tribunals, the president cannot ignore the limitations placed on him by Congress in the Uniform Code of Military Justice. He cannot run the military commissions without certain process rules in place regarding the defendant's right to be present and to, uh, to see evidence submitted against him and regarding the admission of that evidence. And secondly, that common Article Three of the Geneva Convention applies to this conflict with Al-Qaeda. That was a huge issue, whether it was even applicable or not, and the United States Supreme Court said that the Geneva Convention is applicable. Uh, these statutory commands from the Uniform Code include that there must be the most fundamental protection afforded, uh, and that's the right to be present when evidence is, is presented against you. Uh, the Uniform Code also requires the, the compliance with Common Article Three of the Geneva Convention. So, the, what something that the court did not decide, the United States Supreme Court last term in this case, did not decide whether the Geneva Convention is enforceable in court, is judicially enforceable in and of itself, or whether it's just something that's enforceable through uh, executive negotiation and that kind of thing. They didn't have to decide that because the statute the Code of Military Justice statute brought in the Geneva Convention and through the statute said these particular terms of the Geneva Convention apply um, and are enforceable and are important. Um, Article 3 of the Geneva Convention protects persons who have laid down arms in a conflict and provides that they be tried by a regularly constituted court attending all judicial guarantees recognized 
as indispensable by civilized people. So the court said that applies through the statute. So you can see that these rulings are dependent on the statute and for the need, the need for the president to be both acting with authority and acting pursuant to the directive that he would, would see in the statute. And it's clear, in fact, some of the justices in the Hamden opinion invited the president to do this. It's clear that the president can go back to Congress, get all of this change to his satisfaction, and it's likely that the military commissions that result from that effort will be acceptable to the United States Supreme Court. Now, I think there's still a little open question about the Geneva Convention and whether that would apply in and of itself. Whether we can enforce that judicially, I don't know. That wasn't addressed in this case. But we know now from the news that this is what President Bush is doing. Uh, there's um, a tremendous negotiation going on now. He has urged Congress to give him and restore to him the powers that the Supreme Court stripped away in Hamden. Uh, most importantly, the power to create and employ the military commissions to govern trials of enemy combatants under very different procedures than regular trials or court-martial court trials and to define the precise meaning of the Geneva Conventions when it comes to in, uh, interrogations. I don't know if anybody caught the press conference this morning, but I saw a little bit of it, and uh, the president was saying that with respect to the Geneva Convention, he believes it's vague, he thinks it needs to be clarified through statute, and we have the authority to do that. He says that those who are engaged in the interrogation at the, at the ground floor, um, really don't understand the rules because the rules are too vague. So he clearly wants to narrow them, but he says he as well would like to clarify what the rules are. There is a proposal that would allow the use of hearsay, but maybe not evidence that reaches the point of being coercive. Uh, I think the elimination of secret evidence appears to be a key proposal under debate and certainly the Geneva Convention and the application of Common Article 3, we have heard from several senators, including John McCain, that they will not compromise when it comes to the Geneva Convention standards of humane treatment. So that's all in play right now, all generated from an uh, important court decision last term, and really gets to the heart of the Constitution because it's all about the separation of powers and the different powers enjoyed by each branch of government. Let me talk, too, about a couple of more sort of hot-button controversial topics. After several years of avoiding any abortion regulation cases, the court had one on its docket last term, which it resolved unanimously and quite easily on a remedy, on a remedy ground. But there's another one coming up. This one's a biggie. And so a look at the Constitution in action these days requires some thinking about abortion. Talk about chaos. Uh, let's start with some first principles to get a feeling for where that's going. The Constitution guarantees a woman the right to choose to terminate a pre-viability pregnancy. Now where does that come from? We know from Roe versus Wade that the court found that it springs from the due process clause of the 14th Amendment, which protects against state action the right to privacy, including a woman's qualified right to terminate a pregnancy. But the Due Process Clause says nothing about privacy. It certainly says nothing about abortion. What it does say is, uh, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. So where does it come from? The Supreme Court has found in a number of key precedent that the right to privacy is encompassed within various rights recognized in this concept of an ordered liberty. Again, the ordered liberty and the notion of liberty, which is protected in the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. And that includes the right to make certain intimate personal decisions, including decisions about one's own body, without governmental interference. So therein lies the constitutional right uh, to uh, choose to terminate a pre-viability pregnancy. This right is not unqualified, though. A state or Congress may impose restrictions on abortions that do not impose an undue burden on a woman's constitutional right to choose an abortion. And therein lies the source of so much conflict and debate today. 
uh, as Justice Berger said in his foreword in my pocket constitution, a clash of views in debate. Uh, what do we mean by undue burden, what's allowed and what's not allowed in terms of regulations? The debate now is pretty much focused on a requirement from the Supreme Court, came down a few years ago, that there must be a health exception written into any regulation of abortion. The health exception is something that protects the health of the woman. Um, and the court has said pretty clearly in a decision that came down from Nebraska, where Nebraska had a, what, you know, the partial birth abortion ban law, um, the court said that Nebraska law was unconstitutional because it did not contain a health exception. Well, next term, um, we, and an er, fairly early argument into the term, we will see the Federal Partial Birth Abortion Ban Act uh, up for review. And this is a constitutional review by the United States Supreme Court. That act subjects any physician who knowingly performs a partial birth abortion to civil and criminal penalties, including up to two years of incarceration. The act requires a deliberate and intentional act. It exempts doctors from criminal liability if the procedure is necessary to save the life of the woman. But it does not contain an exception if necessary to preserve the health of the woman. And this is what the dispute is all about. Just some you know, factual information from the Ninth Circuit case. There, there, have been, there have been five lower courts that have heard or that have analyzed this Federal Partial Birth Abortion Act, two circuit courts and three district courts, and they have all found the act unconstitutional uh, because it lacks the health exception. The act has never taken effect because the minute it came down, it was challenged. So it's been under scrutiny ever since. And now it is you know, in front of the United States Supreme Court. The Ninth Circuit, of course, we are from the Ninth Circuit, so, and the Ninth Circuit is really always you know, very much a leader in the United States Supreme Court. We see a lot of Ninth Circuit opinions. The Ninth Circuit has the most comprehensive review of the federal act. And from the Ninth Circuit opinion, there's some factual uh, information that I think might be important to keep in mind, especially as we get closer to the oral arguments and you start seeing more press about this, about this type of abortion. This form of abortion occurs only in the second trimester. Now the vast majority of abortions, 90%, are performed in the first trimester. Um, so though sometimes though, a fetal anomaly or maternal health problems are discovered in the second trimester. Sometimes the um, ultrasounds or the amniocentesis exam is only available in the second trimester, and that might be why, but there might be many reasons why. But every now and then these discoveries will lead to a woman wanting to exercise the right to choose the pregnancy in the second trimester. Of the 10% performed then, only 1% are performed after the 20th week, and only a very small fraction of the 1% are performed after the 24th week and the 24th week is when scientific standards that exist today tell us that's the earliest point of viability, scientific viability. There's a clash of debate about, about all of this, isn't there? But that's the science behind it, and that's the data behind this form of abortion. The absence of the health exception is what the court will really focus on, I think. And that uh, was done by Congress very intentionally. I mean, Congress had the United States Supreme Court opinion from Nebraska with a very similar act saying you must have a health exception. And instead of you know, writing the health exception into the federal act, Congress instead found that there exists substantial evidence that a ban on partial birth abortion is not required to contain a health exception because a partial birth abortion is never medically necessary. It kind of entered into the record these factual findings that it's never necessary to preserve the health of a woman. The transcripts of the legislative debate illustrate just how central this decision was to the actual act. Senator after senator objected to the act because it did not include the health exception as required by the United States Supreme Court. Senator Santorum, who is a co-sponsor of the act, responded in comments that he made directly to the United States Supreme Court. He said, quote, we are here because the Supreme Court defended the indefensible. We have responded to the Supreme Court. I hope the justices read this record because I am talking to you. There is no reason for a health exception. 
he candidly explains as well why they are so set against the health exception. And why is this such a big deal? Because it is viewed as an open-ended, you know, doctors can justify anything under health. Um, and he explained that. He said, you know, we think health means anything, so there's really no restriction at all. Um, so one of the key issues now before the court is how much discretion should reviewing courts give to congressional findings like that one, that there's no medical necessity? How much discretion is due? The courts are all, the Supreme Court is all across the board on this. Some cases say, got to give them a lot of discretion for that hard work that they've done. And other cases say, not so much. Not so much deference is due. In this case, the Ninth Circuit completely bypassed the need to make that determination because it found that under any, under the most deferential standard, to give Congress the most benefit of the doubt, it still could not accept that particular finding because the record contained all sorts of contradictory evidence. There really is no consensus on whether it's medically necessary in certain cases sometimes or never necessary. Um, and in fact, the administration even conceded in its reply brief to the Ninth Circuit. It made a concession that both sides now concede, it said, the existence of contradictory evidence in the congressional and trial records. So the Ninth Circuit, in the face of this, held that it simply could not defer to con Congress's finding and ruled that the act was unconstitutional. The other thing is, last term in the only abortion case we've seen for a while, um, it, it was called the Ayet case out of New Hampshire, the court was looking at a similar regulation, it was a state regulation that didn't contain a health exception and required minors to uh, tell their parents what was going on. Um, the court found that the statute from New Hampshire was constitutionally flawed, but instead of voiding out the whole thing, they sent it back to the courts to kind of write in the, the, to write in the health exception, to sort of judicially write it in and fix it for the cases that demanded that, rather than voiding the whole thing. As a matter of remedy, it determined it could do that. Well, the Ninth Circuit looked at doing that with this federal law, but in the face of the legislative record and all the comments from the sponsors of this act, the Ninth Circuit decided we cannot, we are not judicially empowered to write something in that they so desperately do not want. They did not want this act with the health exception, so it is beyond judicial competence to write it in. And so the Ninth Circuit completely voided the entire federal ban, and that is up for review. Interestingly, the oral argument will be November 8th, and the congressional elections, the big elections, are going to be November 7th. So uh, it'll be, I'm really going to watch and see whether there's going to be a lot of buzz about the, whenever the oral argument like this on partial birth abortion gets into, the, into play. It's, uh, it's always difficult. Th these things are tough no matter where you are on, on any of these issues. This is not pleasant stuff. And it is thought that if there's a lot of press, it will be helpful to the Republicans in the, um, in the November 7th elections. So we'll see. All right, finally, let's see if I'm out of time. No, I think I do have a little bit more time. Um, I'd like to talk now, too, about another case that will be in front of the Supreme Court this term. And this case involves racial integration um, in the public school system. And that is an equal protection uh, analysis. So we look again in my pocket constitution, which is almost 20 years old, um, of, at the Equal Protection Clause, which says, uh, nor shall any state deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of its laws. Um, that is applicable to the case in front of the, the case in front of the court this term, which asks whether a school district, public school district, that has not been declared racially segregated and that usually allows students to attend the school of their choice, can that district change its program to one that uses race as a tiebreaker for the really popular schools? Or would that be considered racial balancing, which would be in violation of the Equal Protection Clause? This case comes out of Seattle. It's, it's, it looks like it's going to be a really interesting case. Seattle is a very diverse community, but its, um, it's uh, housing, you know, its neighborhoods are not diverse. Uh, people have made segregated choices in where they live around Seattle. 
Uh, in fact, 40% of the public school students are white in the Seattle area, in the whole district area, and 60% are non-white. Um, but the housing pattern, as I say, is segregated. Uh, generally, a majority of the district's white students live north of the downtown Seattle area, and a majority of the non-white students live south of downtown. The district operates 10 high schools. Four of them are north, six of them are south. So if the students are permitted to just go to the school that's nearest them, we've got a very, very segregated school districts, schools, high schools, looking at each one. Um, and the district has been trying to integrate its schools since the 1960s um, to attain desegregation pursuant to Board versus Brown, 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 Brown versus Board of Education. Um, so basically, they've been operating under, they've been making a good faith effort and trying different things and different programs, but without a judicial order to do that. Uh, in fact, the ACLU and the NAACP sued the city of Seattle, the public school system in Seattle, in 1977 for being too um, segregated, but dropped the complaint after the district voluntarily agreed to develop a mandatory desegregation plan. So that's where we're at with Seattle. They, they, what they've been trying to do is this. They try to make each of their 10 schools as unique as possible to appeal to a wide variety of students and their parents. But the reality is five of the 10 schools are really popular with the kids and they're oversubscribed. You know, they're, they're allowed to choose and those are the ones they choose. And the other five are not. So you've got these schools that are oversubscribed. And what the plan does is it uses some tiebreakers when a child wants to get into an oversubscribed school. And one of the tiebreakers is race. If the school they're trying to get into is not integrated, meaning it doesn't, they've defined that. They've defined it as you have to come within 15% of the general population makeup. So let's say it's 60% non-white. If the school gets to be where it's like 80% non-white, it would be considered segregated. Um, and then they would move to the tiebreaker to try to integrate it. So the tiebreaker has been employed in use and very successfully integrating these schools. And it works uh, against or for, or whatever you want to think, it works against both white and non-white. So sometimes you get a white student who's trying to get into a school that's way too overbalanced, too, you know, there's, it's not integrated and it's 80% white, they will be told no, um, even if that school's right down the street from them and because there's an effort to integrate. But it's happening in the South, too. The, the, there are several popular oversubscribed schools in the South of downtown area, and so sometimes non-white students frequently are told no for the same reason we need to integrate this school, too. So that's a really interesting plan, um, and that's up for review now before the United States Supreme Court. Under this racial classification standard, now any time you see race being used to classify people like that, the courts looked at, look at it very strictly under a standard we call strict scrutiny, which is almost always deadly and very hostile to the use of race. And so, under, and that's what the Ninth Circuit did. Here again, it's another Ninth Circuit case, right out of Seattle. Um, they, they heard it in bonk, meaning 11 judges decided this case instead of just three, and seven of them decided this is okay, what Seattle's trying to do. This is all right, it doesn't violate equal protection. Uh, and four dissented, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, yep, four dissented, and the Supreme Court is going to hear it. Interestingly, I think the most interesting question in front of the court now for this case is, was presented by one judge in the Ninth Circuit, and he wrote, look, we should not be applying strict scrutiny to these kinds of racial classifications. These are not like the things we've seen in the past where we're actually burdening one group and benefiting another, or where we're using race to segregate people. They did that in the prison system a while ago in California. They tried to put all the races together in the cells because they thought it would be a lot less disruptive that way in prison, and the court said, no, you can't do that. You have to integrate. So anyway, they're not doing that here, just Judge Kosinski in the Ninth Circuit said. They're not trying to, to segregate. They're using race to integrate. So we should not treat that with hostility, he said, under the strict scrutiny standard. We should apply a level of deference, and we should be a little bit more um, deferential to what the 
the community and the district, the school districts are trying to do here. If the court agrees with that, and it makes some sense to me, if the court agrees with that, it'll be a whole new, it'll be a whole new day in equal protection um, analysis. So that, that will be very, very different from the way they've been uh, working with race all the way up until now. Even under the strict scrutiny review, the court could well agree with the Ninth Circuit. Um, in order to pass strict scrutiny, you have to find a compelling state interest and a program that's narrowly tailored to meet that interest. And here, the big precedent is going to be the cases out of the University of Michigan from a couple of terms ago. You guys remember those cases? There was the law school and also the undergraduate school at Michigan, two separate cases. And the court, and they both, in different ways, used race to dis make decisions about applications into the, the programs of study. At the law school, the University of Michigan would look at race as sort of one factor in a very holistic analysis of who to admit to law school. And the Supreme Court said, that's OK. We find a compelling interest, compelling state interest to diversify the classroom. And this doesn't look like a quota or anything. It's just considering it as one factor. So they allowed it. In the undergraduate school, though, race was um, much more, you know, it was, it was identified carefully by the school. And then any candidate who was non-white was given 20 points in their favor automatically toward admission into the program. And the, the Supreme Court didn't like that and struck it down, said that looks too much like a quota. That is a violation of equal protection. The question now is, how do those cases and that precedent, how do they apply to a public school system in high school? Uh, do they, what are the differences? What are, is the interest still compelling to integrate? And there's lots of good discussion about how important it is, the Ninth Circuit thinks, to integrate our classrooms early, you know, in high school, to avoid uh, racial hostility and incidents and that kind of thing as uh, we grow as a society. So all of that will be under review and then whether a program like this is narrowly tailored enough to meet those, those key objectives. So with that, um, I'll conclude by saying it's, go that's, it's going to be an interesting term, this term coming up, uh, involving lots of constitutional cases, just like those two, uh, those two being in the 14th Amendment area. Uh, we don't know a whole lot yet about how the rest of the term will play out because as we get closer to that first Monday in October, the court will take more and more cases. So keep your eyes uh, open, looking for what they'll take, and I, um, I look forward to talking to you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us. Be sure to join us again for part two of our Constitution Day celebration, Rebirth of a Nation, Origins and Ratifications of the Constitution, presented by Dr. Katherine Kaplan. Thank you.